This is Research Like a Pro, episode 157, Tracing 19th Century Germans, part two. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm excited to have Heidi Mathis back to talk with us about German research. Yes, Heidi, thanks so much for coming on and for writing this great blog series on beginning German research. And I know there are a lot of books out there. There's a lot of help with with German research. So we just wanted to mention this isn't all inclusive, but just some really good tips for someone just getting started and wanting to dip their toe in the water. Let's get started. Yeah, and make sure that you read Heidi's blog post because we can't talk about everything that she has included. She has so much more that you can learn from reading. All right, Heidi. So how are you today? Doing good. I'm excited to talk about Germans again. (laughs) All right. Well, let's talk about understanding more about our German ancestors' surname. How can we get that right? Because sometimes it's hard to know. Oh, yeah. This is definitely one of the tricky parts and kind of another one of, you know, along with the church record, uh, kind of another holy grail for for people researching their ancestors. And I feel like I got really lucky with the name Schlag. It's, you know, not very many syllables. It's kind of unique, but yet not too unique. So that might be the perfect name. But obviously there's, you know, it can be tricky when your name is very common, like Schmidt or Schneider or Muller. You're going to have a little bit of a tricky time distinguishing them from other people of the same name. And then other times you're just going to have a name that that your, your ancestor ends up writing it down one way. But as you research back, you find out that it was a very different name back in Germany. So, you know, just because of the language differences and the pronunciation differences, our, our German ancestor was coming over and pronouncing their name to people who were English speakers often. And they wrote it down the best they could often. And then sometimes our German got tired, probably, of trying to get people to understand their name. And so they would just make it easier for people to pronounce. And so I have noticed that very often the surname is going to be different in Germany than it was in the United States. And so kind of untangling that is going to be one of the challenges for a lot of people. For sure. That makes sense that we'd want to know what it was back in Germany so we can go back there and find them in Germany. I think that the church records might be the one place where the name was recorded accurately because the minister actually spoke German and knew how it was spelled and knew what it was. So I think that's a good point to think about who was writing down the record. Was it a census taker who was just doing this by ear or was it someone who actually knew German? Yes, absolutely. Like one thing to think about is I have ancestors that their last name was Fuchs and that's Fox. And they just immediately changed their name to Fox just to be more understood. And, you know, a lot of people's names were just translated. In fact, I was listening to a webinar and they were saying that William Penn, the person who founded Pennsylvania, when the Pennsylvania Dutch were coming in there, he just translated everyone's name. If your name was Zimmerman, he wrote down Carpenter. If your name was Schneider, you wrote down Taylor. <laughs> and so uh, that, you know, that very often is the case. And and I was watching, you know, I just love the show Finding Your Roots. And there was just such a great example in that one. Eric Stone Street is, is an actor and they were doing his genealogy and they found out his grandfather was from Austria. And if they were looking for Stone Street in Austria, they're they're never going to find him. But it turned out his actual name was Steingastner. And I'm probably not pronouncing that right. But um, anyway, that's just a great example of someone directly translating their name. Apparently Stein Gassner means Stone Street. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we have Schultz is my maiden name and we were doing some translation on that, trying to figure out what that came from. And now I can't remember. I think it was the sheriff or something like that, but they came back, you know, in the early, early times too. So so fun to think about what those names were. 
Absolutely. And those Pennsylvania Dutch names, just because spelling, this is something that, you know, I hadn't thought about before, but spelling was not really formalized and codified really until towards the end of the 1800s. And so spelling just naturally just shifts around a lot up until that period. And so if your German ancestor came before that period, especially a Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, that name has had a lot of chances to shift around. And I have just been fascinated as I've looked at Pennsylvania Dutch research and looking at collateral lines and just seeing all the variations that started from one ancestor, like your Eisenhower line. That's fascinating just to see all the different spellings I imagine that you've seen. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yes, we have a few of those different spellings. So what are your tips for how to find our ancestors when there are so many different spellings? How can we use the search boxes and databases to our best advantage? You want to think about how to do your wildcard searches, and that's putting in the little star or the question mark in place of letters. And one thing I've found that was a little bit counterintuitive for me is that often, you know, you know, I was using the first part of my ancestors' names as being, well, they can't mess up the first part of the name, you know, but... I found that they can mess up the first part of the name. (laughs) And so you have to think about using wild cards, even for those beginning parts of their names. In the blog post, I talk about the different letter combinations that sound the same to an English speaker when a German is pronouncing it. Like one is the D and the T. I have an ancestor called Burkhardt. I think when a German pronounce it, it sounds like there's a T there for the last D, but it's actually a D. You know, I found some just really interesting example. My favorite, favorite one is I have a Dutch line and my second great grandmother had a a stepfather named Vandendol. And so her, her name is in records under, under her stepfather's name. And so when she got married and and in a couple of other places, you know, the, the word Vandendol is how I would say it. It's actually written as Fawn Dow with an F. I found this trick of where you can write the surname into Google Translate and you can click on the button to have it be pronounced by the the AI person, but with the Dutch accent, it does sound, Vandendol sounds a lot like Von Dow. So you could see how a poor English speaker would have written down Von Dow. That is a really good tip. I love that. Well, another one of the tricky things is the handwriting. You know, that's hard when you're reading English, but it's even harder when you're trying to find your ancestor's name in the old German handwriting. So what are some tips for the handwriting is a little different than you're used to? This is probably kind of the scariest part of German research. It's super exciting. You get your record and it's got that German handwriting. And and so they had a different kind of cursive that they were teaching people in, in this time period. And it's called Suderlin or current. And they're very similar. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing those. But they they form their letters, some of their letters entirely differently. So it takes some effort to learn to read those scripts. And, you know, handwriting is going to be challenging, even if it's in English. I think you, everybody knows who's tried to translate an old record knows that. But the exciting thing is today, there are some amazing tools and tips for teaching yourself to read those records. And I would say it's worth doing. You know, it's, it's really exciting to be able to get back into a German church book and be able to go through it and really decipher a family tree in there. So I just highly recommend it. What a good idea to learn to recognize your ancestor's name in German handwriting. Do you have some tips for how to do that? Yeah. The first step that I recommend that you take is to use a a script generator. And I list one in the blog or to download a font. There's one called Suderlin dot ttf that i have listed in the blog and so you can if you download that font you can write your ancestor's name you can write their village you can write any of their relatives you can write their occupation you can write their birth month and their birth date written out all of those things are going to help you start to be able to pick out 
that name within all of this, it's going to look like chicken scratch to you. But by doing that, you're going to at least be able to pick out your ancestor's name and their surname. And you'll be able to like, if you've gotten back into a village and you're not even sure if it's your ancestor's village, if you're looking through the records and you just never see your ancestor's surname, you know, that's a clue that you may be in the wrong in the wrong village. But if you're seeing your ancestors surname all over that village, then it's, it's a clue that you are in the right place and you can start looking for their, their first name. I love how you've got the example on the blog post. And I think it's great to have that tip of just kind of getting the feel for what the surname looks like and then skipping through the records to see if you can find it. I recommend everybody go read Heidi's blog post because you can actually see some of the examples that are so helpful but you've got another tip that is watching some webinars. And I love webinars for learning things like this, these really specific things, because sometimes just watching it and then trying it is the best way to learn. So do you have some good resources? I'm with you, Diana. I love watching webinars and it's just such a good refresher course often, even if you've done some of this research before. There are some amazing webinars out there. Obviously, Legacy Family Tree has fantastic ones, but you know, my favorite ones are at Family Search and they're free. I explain how to get into those webinars and they have done a recent one that was 10 parts on German handwriting. And believe me, if you go through that 10 part series, you know, you're going to be well on your way and you may not even have to go through all 10 parts, but they have great practices and handouts. I just can't uh, recommend enough taking one of those series because they'll, they'll start showing you letter combinations and the fact that in German, they had three different ways that an S can appear in the middle of a word and the fourth and fifth way that it can be seen at the beginning and the end of a word. Also, it's very difficult to tell the I's from the U's from the E's, but they have some little hints on how to do that. And so Family Search, the people there have done such a good job. I have learned so much from watching the great German in general webinars there. Oh, that's a really good clue. And I know that those are not always super easy to find on Family Search. So I'm glad that you have the waypoints for how to get those in the blog post because they, they can be a little bit hidden in, in the website. They can be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any tips for what to do when you find a word or a phrase that you just cannot decipher? This happens a lot. And this is something you can use whatever language you're working in. Oh, maybe if you do crossword puzzles too, you can use this, this website. And it's called wordmind.info. It allows you to switch to a language. So in this case, you'd be switching to German. And let's say you can read the beginning of the word. And so you, you select for what part of the word you can read and you write in the letters that you're pretty sure of. And then you count up the possible number of letters in that word. And then it gives you just a list of words in German that it could possibly be. And, and so it really is such a great way to narrow down the list of what it could be. Cause you know, you're trying to find a word in a language you don't speak. And so it's hard to think of what alternatives this word could be. And so I love that word mind.info. It's, I recommend it for, even if you're trying to transcribe a document from English, it can be really helpful too. Wow. I am so excited to try that. There are so many times when you just have most of the letters, but you cannot figure it out. And sometimes it's just so maddening. <laughs> you're, you're looking at it and like, I know what that has to be, but I can't really see it right now. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And you can waste a lot of time doing that. And so this, I think, is a, a great tip. Wow. I do a lot of crossword puzzles, so that might help in that too. <laughs> no cheating. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you just get stuck and you just don't want to think anymore. So that's a great <laughs> tip. I love that wordmind.info and for transcribing in any language, that could be a great help. Well, let's talk about word lists because I heard a lot about word lists in whatever language that you're researching in, that as long as you know the main words that would be in a record that you're interested in, you can read a record. So what are your thoughts on that? Family Search again has some great word lists, and I gave the links to those in the blog post. You're going to want to learn all the basic words, and often when you get to a record, German records are often in columns, and that's super helpful. You're going to need to translate what each of the columns are 
you know, what's helpful about that is that they'll have a column that just has the baby's information in it. And so, you know, when you're looking in that column, you're not going to find the parents' names. You're just going to find the baby's name. But some German records can be in a paragraph style. And those to me are the hardest. You know, those are the records where you're going to just want to focus on the words you can find from your word list. You know, all the basic words like father, mother, burial, birth, marriage. And then there are some great word lists for occupations. And there can be archaic occupations, occupations that we no longer have. And then Germans tended to have a lot of different words for each dialect of German. There tends to be different synonyms for the same occupation. And so you're going to want to check those archaic occupation lists. And as a tip, you may want to check those if you have a surname that you just cannot figure out because often people's surnames were from occupations. And so I think that's a really helpful thing. And then I wanted to mention just briefly, um, and I can't, I may not pronounce her name right, but Barbell uh, Johnson, I saw her lecture at the last German genealogical conference that's coming up in July again. And I saw her a couple of years ago in Sacramento. And she, I just love the fact that she is really interested in all the names in German that there are for farmer. Apparently in English, we just have one word, but she has found it. She's kind of just had an interest in writing down every word she can find for farmer. And she's up to a few hundred, I think, different <laughs> words for farmer in German. So you're going to want to know some of those words. The other thing that I would highly recommend is this dictionary called, and I'm not, I'm going to butcher it, but it's Wurtenbuchnetz. And it's a basically this dictionary that is kind of a combination, like, you, you know, in English, we have the Oxford English Dictionary that lists a lot of how words were formed and a lot of archaic words. And so this, this dictionary is a combination of many, many different dictionaries. So it covers current usage and also usage from centuries ago. And so that's going to be really helpful if you get a word in, in your German record that you cannot find a translation for it. And that's all in German. So when I get a website that's all in German, I use Chrome to translate it all into English, but then I also keep up a page on the other side in German so that I can kind of make sure I can follow along and don't get myself lost in it. Very often, the German websites are much better than the English sites. And so when you're using this dictionary, it's kind of a little bit daunting. But I, I think if you've got a surname or a word that you just cannot find the meaning of, I think this is worth delving into. Great tip. I had a question about place names and locations. So sometimes that's the hardest to figure out. Do you have any ideas for how we can figure out what the place names are? Yeah, the, the Myers Gazetteer is, you know, every German researcher's best friend. It's just amazingly well organized. And I go through in the blog post exactly how to use it. But you're going to want to use Myers to help you zone in on the correct name for your ancestor's village, because often, you know, it's going to be misspelled in the record that you find in America. And you're going to want to use the wild cards. And often you're going to get to a village name that there's going to be several villages with the same name in Germany. And so you're, you know, definitely going to want to pay attention to what state and what Kreis and Kreis's county is like in German. So you're going to want to keep those jurisdictions together with the village you're looking for. I can't recommend using Myers enough, just helping you zone in on that correct village name. Really super important thing to remember is that Family Search uses the jurisdictions from Myers. And so those terms from Myers, once you find the right village, you're going to want to use the terms that Myers uses when you search for things in Family Search. So that's another huge takeaway that I, I'd love for everyone to have going away. I had no idea about that. Thank you for telling us all about that. Well, our time is up for this episode. So in parting, do you have any final tips for us? Yeah, I, I would highly recommend joining an online community to help you with you know, when you get stuck, if you're diving in there and trying to read your records, if you get stuck, I've listed the online community at Family Search and also some great Facebook groups that you can join. 
because that's an awesome way to to kind of crowdsource your research. Oh, that is a great way. And I think maybe we don't think about that enough. Facebook groups are wonderful, as well as that community on family search. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. This has been great to talk about how to tackle some of these challenges with reading the handwriting and figuring out the name. So we will continue with this podcast series in a bit with Heidi, and we're excited to keep learning how to research our German American ancestors. So thanks so much, Heidi, for coming on. Oh, it was so much fun for me. All right. We'll talk to you guys again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our Research Like a Pro online course or join our next study group. Learn more at FamilyLocket.com. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our e-course or study group. If you like what you heard and would like to support this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.